So some time ago, an actress named Anna Lynn McCord, some of you all may recognize the name, you may not, was photographed without wearing makeup. And the candid shots hit the web, and things went crazy all over social media, okay? One side even noted, one side even, there was a comment on one of the posts that said, her facial blemishes were completely visible. Can you believe that? What? So if you look up here, you're going to see a picture of Anna Lynn McCord. You're going to see makeup, no makeup. I thought it was all the way around. <laughs> Now, what was amazing is, it was her reaction to all this. She actually came out in public and said, this is newsworthy, me not wearing makeup. The more I thought about it, the more upset I got, she said. So a week after the first pictures were put out on the web, and a big deal was made, out of, made, out, made of her without any makeup, a barefaced McCord snapped a photo of herself and posted it on her Twitter account, for her over 187,000 followers to see. She went on to say that the posting was her reaction to society's unrealistic standards of beauty. McCord was angry over how people reacted to her without makeup. And she said there are days she just wants to scream something to the entire world about how unrealistic the world's standard of beauty is. I want you to look around this room. Just take a second, look around the room. If you're on the front row, look back. If you're in the middle, look in the front and the back. Did you see it? No. Many of you are wondering. I know Meredith wondering what she was supposed to be seeing. I want you to see others around you who are as worried about their outward appearance as you are. Oh, dang. No. I want you to hear, I want you to hear some statistics, because some of y'all are going to laugh this off, but this applies to guys and girls. 96% of the teens in America are not satisfied with their smile, leading to insecurity about their appearance. No, I like my smile. 30% out of that 96% are most worried about how their teeth look when they take a picture. In one study, teens were asked to rate how satisfied they are with their physical appearance by scoring weight, figure, body build, focusing on breast, stomach, waist, thighs, buttocks, hips, legs, face, and hair. And the study concluded that 61% of the teens in that particular study were dissatisfied with how they look. So when you looked around this room, that means more than half the people in this room, two-thirds of this room, is not happy with the way they look right now. Another study found that 31% of teens are ashamed of their body image. That's staggering. One out of every three doesn't like their body shape or their body image. 40% said images on social media have caused them to worry about their image. 35% have stopped eating at some point or restricted their diets because they worry about their body image. 40% have said that things their friends have said have made them worry about their body image. 35% worry about it often and daily. Or daily. 37% feel upset and ashamed because of their body image. 38% are insecure about their weight. 21% are insecure about their skin type or their skin tone or their composure. This one was staggering to me. These last two. 94% think their, their appearance influences their popularity. And 87%, 9 out of 10 basically, there's about 30 people in this room. So 20 of you wish you could alter your appearance in some way. Change. 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 Change who you are. Nine out of ten. On this front row alone, there are eight people. That means seven of you want to change the way you look. Um. 
you know, unfortunately, almost all of us, including the adults in the room, have gotten caught up in what, what our world sees as important. And it's what can be seen. It's an outward appearance. And that's where we place our value. But tonight, I want you to begin to understand that with God, it's, it's what can't be seen that matters the most. It's an inner beauty that doesn't fade, that doesn't change, that doesn't go away. It's who you are on the inside that God values most. A matter of fact, I'm going to challenge you to not only begin to see others that way, but to see yourself that way. I'm going to challenge you to begin to think about how you look at yourself every day when you look in a mirror. I'm going to challenge you to think about how you look at others when you see them at school or in the neighborhood, or at work. If you got a Bible with you tonight, open it up to 1 Peter chapter 3. We're only looking at two verses. Wait. Yeah, I was say, if you want one, we got some up here. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. First Peter chapter three verses three and four. Got it. Oh, I'm, I'm Peter writes, "Don't be concerned about the outward beauty of fancy hairstyles, expensive jewelry, or beautiful clothes. You should clothe yourselves instead with the beauty that comes from within, the unfading beauty of a gentle, quiet spirit, which is so precious to God." Now, I want you to understand, Peter is not saying that we shouldn't care about how we look. He is not saying that we shouldn't take pride in taking care of ourselves. He's not saying, don't take a shower and don't put on deodorant. Okay? No, no, not actual deodorant, not bar soap. He's not saying, don't clean yourselves, don't smell good, don't wear nice stuff. What he's saying is, don't put all your value in that stuff. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, ladies, but I bet there's some of you in this room that wouldn't think about going out the door without makeup on. Oh, I'll do that. I wear makeup not that much. I don't know if I can do it. He's saying, Paul is saying that while keeping ourselves looking and smelling nice is important, that we should tend to make a bigger deal, that we tend to make a bigger deal of it than we should. That we put great emphasis on wearing the right things, having the right shoes, looking the right way. And before you begin to say this is all a girl problem, it is not. I know guys. I lived with one of them. He was the pastor at Winter Retreat. His name's Garrett. He would change outfits sometimes four or five times a day because he didn't like what he had on. I'm accused of that. <laughs> Don't worry, I hear it from him. Yeah, my mom got what Peter is saying is that there is something of far greater importance than how we look on our outside. And unfortunately, we become so consumed with how we look on the outside that we don't invest anything on our inside. We shine and polish what we look like on the outside, but on the inside, we're just rotten away and we're full of garbage. You see, God wants us to be more concerned with how we look on the inside. Who we are, not what we are. And I love that statement, and I want you to really, I mean, if you, if you wanted to ever tattoo something on your, on your arm where you can see it every day, be more concerned with who you are, not what you are. Developing an inner, inner, inner spirit of godliness and holiness. Peter wants you to understand that, that being a Christian means that, that you should take as much pride in how you look on the inside as you do on the outside. A matter of fact, you might even say that Peter is looking at us right now and he's challenging us to make a choice. We have to choose to take care of ourselves spiritually, allowing God to transform us and investing in what that relationship looks like. As much or more than we invest in what we look like on the outside. Here's something to think about. How many of you spend more time showering, getting clean, Doing your hair, doing makeup, shaving, whatever you do, working out, building muscles, to include the guys in this room that like to work out, than you do 
praying, and reading the Bible. Because Peter is saying that all this outside stuff is great. Yes, take care of yourself. Look great, feel great, be healthy. But he's saying you ought to invest as much on your inside as you do on your outside. And far too often we buy into the way the world thinks. And we focus on materialism. And we focus on self-assertion. And we focus on sex obsession. And how we are we attractive to the opposite sex? How do we look when we take these pictures? I don't even ask you how many selfies you take in a day. Oh, don't even get oh, I, I, live, I live with a teenage girl. I know it's well over a hundred a day. The thing is, we need to hear Peter's words and take them seriously. We need to understand that the truth is that true beauty begins on our inside. With who we are. Who we want to become. Our character, the integrity we have in our lives. F.B. Meyer, a famous pastor from England, um, was good friends with D.L. Moody back in the 1800s, early 1900s. Once again, those are names you all probably don't know and don't care to know. But he had a very, a very thought-provoking quote when he was sharing on this passage out of 1 Peter. Uh, F.B. Meyer said, Plenty are those whose outward body is richly decked but whose inner being is clothed in rags, whilst others whose garments are worn and threadbare are all glorious within. Set on that for a second. Plenty are those whose outward body is richly decked, but whose inner being is clothed in rags, whilst others whose garments are worn and threadbare are all glorious within. The following is based on a true story. Annie was a large, rather unattractive girl. Actually, to put it bluntly, Annie was fat. Yeah. A member of a youth group, she was a regular attender there every time the door was open. And during one of those youth group meetings, the youth leader introduced a situational learning game called the lifeboat. The dozen or so high school kids that were present that evening were to form their chair to resemble the seating on a lifeboat. And he told the twelve, you are the only survivors of a shipwreck. You managed to make it to this lifeboat. Once you are aboard, you discover to your horror that there are only provisions for 11 people. And the boat can only hold 11 people. Twelve people will eventually sink the boat, leaving all to drown. You twelve must decide what you're going to do. Initially, the group stares blankly at each other for several minutes before busting into a lively conversation. They quickly begin to decide for the good of the majority, someone has to be sacrificed. That's the only way they're all going to live. But who? Who is going to be the sacrifice? So they begin to discuss who would be left to drown. They quickly eliminated several people based off of their perceived value to the survivors. You see, the strongest, most athletic boys, they couldn't go. Because their strength would be needed to row the boat if they ever had any chance of finding land. And naturally, those boys wouldn't think of having any of the pretty girls become shark food. So they found value for all of them. And slowly, each individual in the group, with the exception of Annie, was discussed and discarded as a candidate for sacrifice. Some were too smart, some were too talented, or too popular. Finally, coming to Annie, who might have not, who might have not been attractive, but was not dumb, blurted out, I'll jump. No, 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 everybody protested. The group strongly urged her not to be the sacrifice. But when pressed, they couldn't think of one good reason why she shouldn't jump. So they all remained silent. When the time to play the game ran out, the group members announced they couldn't reach a decision on what to do. The youth worker went on to teach a lesson using the example of the lifeboat. 
problem is Annie had already learned the lesson that night. And the next day, Annie jumped. Her youth group had confirmed her worst thoughts about herself. She truly was of no value. Her friends in the youth group were baffled and deeply saddened by her suicide. After all, she had so much to live for. They just couldn't think of what it was. We rarely look below the surface to see a person as Christ sees them. All of us make judgment calls. Sometimes so quickly that we don't even think about it. Just last night I was watching Jeopardy with my wife and they were introducing the candidates. We watch it every night. And the first one that comes out was a, was a woman that was a middle school teacher. I was like, yep, I told you that was a middle school teacher. The next one was an uh, e uh, economics professor. You know, he had a bow tie on it. And, you know, so, yep, yep, that's, that's obviously an economics professor. I'm making judgment calls based on what I see. How many of you drive by anymore? You can't really miss them. They're all over the place. I saw them out again today. The people at these intersections that are holding up signs saying they're homeless and that they're hungry. How many of us judge them when we drive by them? Based on what we see. How many of us attach a person's value with his or her looks? Or their popularity? Or their possessions? Or their abilities? How many of us attach our value to those things? And if none of those things are obvious, then we fail to see any value, either in ourselves or in others. You see, I think we all need to stop using outward appearance as how we see others. Stop letting that be the barometer for how we measure things. And start beginning to ask God to let you see others as He sees them. Who they are on the inside. We need to spend less time in front of a mirror or working out and more time developing our character to become more in line with what God values. I just want you to think about these questions as I get ready to close and send you off to small groups. Do you compare or judge yourself against others? Don't answer that out loud. Are you guilty of paying more attention to your outer beauty than your inner beauty? Do you spend more time working on your appearance than you do reading God's Word or in prayer or sharing Jesus with others? You see, that's the stuff that God sees. That's the stuff we should see is that inner character. Who people are on the inside and what they're on the outside. Let's pray, guys. Father, I thank you so much for tonight, God. I thank you for a chance just to spend a few minutes in your word. And how just a couple verses can challenge how we think about ourselves and how we think about others. Father, I pray just now that you be with us as we move into small groups. That you just allow the discussions to be real and honest and open. And maybe even a little raw, God, as we begin to share with each other our own struggles, and how we need to change. We love you. Amen. Okay, you guys are dismissed in small groups. You will go with Samuel. Um, who's in Samuel group? Who's in Samuel group? Go with Angel to so get to the right spot.